ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Lock and load. It's time for the gun rack with your hosts, Joey and Drew. Welcome, everyone, to the gun racks and Northern Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology's official podcast. I'm Josiah Upper. Folks call me Joey. And with me, we have one Drew Poplin. Quick shout out to, uh, Jose Torres, he actually just commented, I want to say it was yesterday or today, he commented on our episode 126 on Puppy. He said, awesome info, keep warm out there. Well, Mr. Torres, I'm doing my best. Thank you very much for uh, your comment. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. And then just a shout out to all of you guys listening. I was taking a look at some of the analytics, and it turns out September was our best performing month of all time. Yay! Um, which is really awesome, and it's been really cool seeing the show grow, even in my short time being here. I know Joey is feeling like a proud papa right now, and uh, oh yeah. So, just want to say thank you guys for continuing to listen and telling people to listen. Anyway, with that sentimentality out of the way, let's get into some Drew's clues. So, last week's answer was the SKS. This week, your clues. Your Drew's clues. This firearm fires 5.56 by 45. It has a barrel length of 13 inches, a capacity of 30 plus one. It drew inspiration from the AK-47 and the Valmet RK-62. And its current price at Palmetto State Armory is $1,699.99. What do you think it could be? I will also add just that it's fair. There is also a version of this that includes a 762 by 39. And there's a version of this that includes 308. Many, many talented. Wow, many talented, multi-talented is this particular firearm. And it's another one that is near and dear to my heart. Oh, this one's a little more famously so than some of the other ones. Yeah. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, you referenced it not too long ago. I reference it constantly. Um, I don't. I feel like giving its context within my collection would just give it away for anyone that that's listened to more than one episode. But maybe just having said that alone <laughs> is <isn't laughs> yeah, more and more meta as we go, and it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. Um, this is my main semi-automatic rifle. And has been for five years now and will be for the foreseeable future, because I don't know how you can improve upon it, except for maybe to uh, acquire its second generation, uh, which Drew and I were able to mess around with in March. And it was really cool. So a lot of hints there, but you can still come in with a message on uh, leave a comment on our YouTube channel. We do monitor those. Or send an email to marketing at sdi.edu. If you get in first and you are correct, we will send you some goodies. I am trusting that Drew is doing that in my full-time absence there at SDI. But now, Drew, who, what is Sonoran Desert Institute? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So let's talk about SDI. Sonoran Desert Institute is an online school. SDI helps students learn the skills and techniques they'll need to be successful in the firearms industry and the unmanned technology industry. SDI is an accredited school. They are accredited by the Distance Education Accrediting Commission, otherwise known as the DEAC. And since this is a firearms podcast, let's talk about firearms. You know, how does SDI help you in the firearms industry? Well, we have two offerings at this moment. We have a certificate program, the Certificate in Firearms Technology Gunsmithing program, as well as the Associate in Science in Firearms Technology. Both of those are awesome programs. Definitely should check them out. If you want to learn more, go to our website. Go to www.sdi.edu. There you can find all sorts of information, course catalogs, uh, what you know, the history of SDI, what we stand for. It's a great resource for you to find out more. 
So I encourage you to go there. And if you have any questions, reach out to our missions team. Um, you can either go to the website and go to the contact us page. You can send them an email at missions at sdi.edu, or you can give them a call. Their number is 480-999-4767. Again, 480-999-4767. All right, everyone. So we're going to get into the topic for the day if there's a little bit of an overlap between this section and the previous sections. I apologize. A little bit of technical difficulties prevented us from doing this straight, so I'm actually flying solo here for the meat of this. Uh, we want to thank Drew for being as flexible as he is. We're going to take care of you guys just like the days of old. We're going to talk about the top five non kind of non-standard whitetail hunting cartridges. We are on the very doorstep uh, for a lot of people of the hunting season for whitetail. Uh, it is a great time to be a hunter. As the season starts to change, you start to get ready. Go out there and uh, re-zero those rifles, folks. Make sure that you are 100% ready to go. With this kind of thing, there are some very standard rounds for whitetail hunting, and then there's a lot of other rounds people just bring out there, right? The first... In fact, I don't think I've ever taken a deer with what people would consider to be a not uh, a standard kind of mainstream round. I've only used uh, two of the cartridges on this list of five. I wanted to share these with you. And, uh, oh, actually, I've got a bonus one. It's going to be six. Six cartridges here. Uh, for you guys, and uh, I'm going to share these with you so that you guys know not only that there are lots and lots of standard rounds uh, for which to harvest deer, but there are other rounds that work too. All right, let's get into it. First thing is first, a lot of people hunt with what they have, and there is nothing wrong with that. And uh, because of that uh, tendency, there is a tendency to use a lot of mill syrup and a lot of um, kind of obscure, kind of collector style rounds uh, in hunting if you're not using your traditional stuff. And when we're talking about traditional cartridges, I'm thinking 308, uh, if you want to be a boomer, 30-06, 270, 243, um, 240, 12 gauge, obviously. And uh, a lot of the, the hunting can fall under those categories. A lot of those, if you go get a Remington 700, there's a very good chance it's chambered in one of those rounds. So if you are not interested in that, or you simply don't have it, there are other options available for you. The very first one we're going to use here is the 223 Remington. Of course, the 223 Remington is famous for being kind of associated with the AR family of rifles. And uh, for good reason, obviously. But the 223 is used by hunters on occasion to hunt. And uh, I actually do not own a 223 rifle, which I'm kind of embarrassed to say. I've always been a uh, 762 kind of guy. Should probably change that here before too long. But if that is all you have, if all you have is a, a black rifle, right? The 223 Remington can work. The problem, not even the problem, the challenge with 223 Remington is that you are limited in uh, some of your opportunities. And I'm going to take an excerpt here from North American Whitetail, a gentleman who, uh, Keith Wood, sorry, I wanted to make sure I credited him correctly. Uh, Keith Wood has taken multiple Whitetail with the 223 Remington, and he shared a little bit of what worked and what didn't work with it, and I'm going to share that with you guys. Um, the immediate impulse, thinking about 223, and this is kind of a thing for 243, even though it's an extremely common round, is that it feels too small, right? It feels like it's not big enough to do the job. But let's let's look at this excerpt here. He says, uh, we know what 223 can do. Let's talk about what it can't do reliably. It talks about he went to a mule deer hunt 
And uh, the, he says, the shot I ended up with was a 280-yard steep downhill quartering on shot at a four-point muley. Didn't have a rest, and the wind was blowing. Admittedly, it was a tough shot that I wouldn't have dreamed of taking with a 2-2-3. There it is, right? Um, the 2-2-3 works just fine, according to him. If you are working out of a stand or a ground blind where the shots aren't super long, and there's generally a rail or a tree limb for a passable shooting rest. I paraphrased a little bit, but those are his his the gist of his words. But he points out, on a real wilderness hunt for a trophy animal, you sometimes have to take quick, tough shots from bad angles. Uh, and when challenging shots present themselves, you need a cartridge that's far more than just adequate to get the job done. Uh, he said that he has shot more than a dozen uh, deer with the 223, and that it's a viable con uh, cartridge when the appropriate bullets are used. If you are going to hunt with it, he notes that uh, you need to be prepared to pass on an animal when the angle or distance isn't right. It both will not be successful and not be humane. So that's the 223. A uh, very, very common cartridge and uh, probably cheaper than a lot of these other cartridges we'd be looking at. Um, something to keep in mind. That's the 223 Remington. Next one I think is kind of fun. Uh, this is the 357 Magnum. And uh, when we're thinking about 357 Magnum, generally we're talking about some sort of very nice revolver. Uh, or that's in our head. You can get pretty crappy revolvers with 357 too. It's all one. I love a good revolver. But there's some pretty cool stuff you can do once you take that cartridge and put it into a rifle. As Richard Mann from Game and Fish magazine points out, hunters have been successfully taking deer with 357 Magnum uh, for a long time, but for some reason, 357 Magnum rifle is considered is considered, excuse me, less than adequate. This is ludicrous if a deer can be killed with a 357 Magnum handgun, a 357 Magnum rifle with an additional 300 to 600 feet per second behind the bullet should be more effective and indeed it can be. The hunter must use the right ammunition. Something to keep in mind with this, if you use and this is according to the same source uh, lever action 357 Magnum, you have a big game load capable of taking deer past 200 yards. Oh, he says past 200 yards. I probably wouldn't push it past 200 yards myself. This is a closer range option, in my opinion. And it's got, it is not a flat shooting round either. Something else he noted was that he, he zeroed his scope at 200, uh, 150 yards. And one of the loads he used, uh, it's called hammer down, hit about three and a half inches high at 100 yards and nine inches low at 200 yards. Uh, so at about 175 yards, it's dead on hold. And uh, you really, really, really don't want to be pushing it past 200 yards. I'm going to go against the point that he made. He probably meant if you work really, really hard on it past 200 yards. But if you're hooking this thing nine inches low to your zero at 150 yards and the difference is 50 yards, I would say that this is probably a 200 yards and fewer rifle. So for those of my friends out there out in the West um, or in any of those spaces where there's lots and lots of uh, open space, 357 Magnum from a rifle might not be the cartridge for you, but if you're like me, and you live in the southeast, and a lot of the clearings that we're looking at are a lot of the shots that I take are right at 100 yards, uh, or give or take 25. The 357 Magnum hunting cartridge might be for you. It's something to think about. It's kind of a fun cartridge, too, especially if you already have the revolver. You can keep everything in one happy family. Always fun. 357 Magnum rounds are fairly expensive, as I'm sure you guys know. So the uh, savings might not be quite as strong as some other places. That's number two. Number three, and these are all technically Milserp, although the one that we're about to talk about is a little bit of both. Milserp and just kind of a general cartridge. And this is going to be the 4570 government. Uh, the 4570 is regarded 
by a lot of people that uh, as overkill, right? It's the 4570 is a freaking beast of a cartridge from which you can, uh, it's, yeah, the, the rifles attached, sorry, can be pretty brutal to the shoulder. Uh, I've done that. I actually, once upon a time, had the opportunity to shoot a 4570 rifle uh, with 22 Plinkster, this was years ago now, in, in his front yard. Uh, which is pretty cool stuff, and uh, that thing kicked like a mule. I had never shot a forty-five seventy before. It's really cool stuff. We went and shot a bunch of watermelon uh, in a row. It was it was brutal, dude. It was absolutely brutal. So, one of the things we want to be talking about with all these is range, and uh, deer and deer hunting points out that the forty-five seventy. Uh, it can be effective out to about 300 yards, um, and that some marksmen might be able to get it out further than that. There have been some changes in the loads. It's a very, the original version of this cartridge is old. I believe it's the 1870s, I think, got this thing out. So again, a little bit of a closer range, and a lot of people have talked about or deer and deer hunting points out that a lot of people moved from 4570 to 3030, which is another one of those very popular cartridges, although 3030 is becoming less and less popular over time. Not really its fault either. It's kind of a shame. Anyway, 4570 is definitely an option for all of my friends who play Battlefield 1 out there. The 4570 is uh, not quite the behemoth that it is in that game, but it is a... It's a really solid cartridge. Uh, it's one I personally really enjoy, and you can absolutely tag deer with it, and uh, I do not think that it's going to be overkill for you. Make sure that you're hunting with all of these with some sort of soft point or hollow point cartridge. Okay, please do not go out there with FMJ. Get some sort of expansive round so that this hunting is done humanely as possible both for the animals that we're harvesting and for future hunters. We want to be the most responsible hunters that we can because there are people coming after us. And uh, the population of hunters out in the world, uh, in the U.S. specifically, is declining. It's, I haven't checked anything this year, but that's been the case. It's uh, fairly common knowledge at this point that that is the case. And if we want to change that and we want to positively impact the community, uh, and expand into hunting, the best way to do it is to bring them up right and uh, picking the right cartridge, uh, as silly as it sounds, it is absolutely part of that. So keep that in mind. Okay, now we're going to get into some real mill serps here. And these are my favorites. I'm going to go with the one that I have not used for hunting. I've owned a rifle chambered in this cartridge, but I did not hunt with it. And then we're going to go with two that I have uh, hunted with. This next one is 303 British. The 303 British is, of course, what the Lee Enfield series of rifles that uh, carried the British through both world wars is. It's an excellent cartridge. And as I'm sure you guys know, the Enfield has a reputation of being preposterously accurate at really good distances. So. One of the things you want to keep in mind uh, with all of this is not only the accuracy, but the, the ability to carry, uh, land a shot that is not only going to hit, but uh, humanely uh, harvest whatever that animal is. So we were just talking about harvesting ethically via the type of bullet in question. Now we're talking about uh, range and the effectiveness. There's one of the reasons the 357. I wouldn't want to push it past 200 yards. I probably wouldn't even want to push it past 150, to be honest with you. The Foundry Outdoors notes that the 303 British is a good choice for whitetail deer hunting under average conditions from a mid-range distance uh, with a medium-grain expanding bullet 
and with correct shot placement. All of these are going to be with correct shot placement. That seems like a little silly caveat, but the rest of this is bang on, right? And one of the reasons people would hunt with this cartridge, I don't know if you would go out of your way to hunt with a 303 British, although that would be kind of fun. Uh, this is one of those things where if you own a Milser Enfield or one of those sporterized Enfields, which I did have once upon a time, they used to be exceptionally cheap. I haven't checked on their prices recently. And you just had it for fun and then you thought about hunting. Well, there's an option for you. That's a legitimate option. It is a good choice as long as you are not out uh, sniping from across the, uh, the globe and the curvature of the earth. Okay, speaking of range-limited excellent cartridges, this is my current hunting rifle setup. I currently use a Ruger American Ranch, chambered in 762 by 39 Soviet. I currently use it actually with two ammo soft point. It's like a soft point or hollow point, I don't remember. Um, ammo, cheap ammo. I think we've mentioned the Ruger American Ranch in here before. It is a very short, very lightweight rifle, and it is capable of hitting at preposterous levels of accuracy. I've taken that 762 by 39 with a scope. I think it's Osprey Global. It's one of those you get at a gun show, and then you're like, why did I buy this? I stuck it on that to see if it would work, because it's a $400 rifle. I figured a $200 scope would make it work just about. And uh, son of a gun, those two things plus cheap ammo, and I, there was one group I had that was about a quarter of an inch wide. It's ridiculous. Absolutely nuts. And, well, not all of them are going to be quite that good. There was, the three of them were, like, on top of each other, and there's other variables and all that nonsense. But uh, comfortably within an inch and a half every single time. Uh, with ammo that really should not be getting those kinds of results. I have nothing but good things to say about the Ruger American Ranch. Ruger's American whole branding thing, I've yet to encounter a firearm in that space that I didn't really like. That's a side tangent, though. 762 by 39 is not a flat shooting cartridge, okay? Uh, your, if you want to zero in a rifle chambered in 762 by 39, you can't. Well, you can, but... The, like, if you want to aim at 50 yards or 25 yards and then walk it out like a lot of people do, I just had this issue with my Galil. It's going to hit at wildly different elevations all the way out. And I next time I'm out and do something like this, I'll measure it and report it back to you guys if I, if I remember to do so. Um, so not a flat shooting bullet, and it can go really high earlier out and uh, really low pass. So you have to remember what you dial it in for. And uh, while the 762 by 39 cartridge is not inherently inaccurate, like lots of people like to poke fun at the AK platform concerning that, it is not a cartridge designed for absolute pinpoint accuracy either. Uh, so if you're going to use hunting cartridges, generally people buy ch the cheapest thing they can that's still humane. Right, that is my experience uh, with all the hunters I know. They buy the cheapest thing they can that's functional and reasonable. Um, if you do that, I would not recommend taking a shot with 762 by 39 past about 250 yards. You're you're getting involved with some pretty serious holdovers at that point, and depending on the firearm it's coming out of, your ability to land accurate shots starts to really come into question. If you're going hunting with an AK platform, you get a PSA AK, our friends over at Palmetto State Armory, something like that. Um, they are, PSA AKs are not meant for hunting at 250 yards. And while I'm certain you can hit a target at 250 yards, uh, if you want really good shot placement, know your rifle well and uh, follow its limitations and its advantages. With my Ruger American Ranch, I will not take a shot past about 200, 225 yards because I know that we're getting into some serious droppage at that point, and I want to make sure I do the best job I possibly can. And uh, that's that's how we do that. That's the 762 by 39. I have a I have a deep abiding love for the cartridge and the uh, the hunting you can do with it. Just be sure to keep in mind its limitations, like all the other ones on this list and really old cartridges in general.
Now this next one, oh boy, you can do some wonderful things with the next one. This is the last one we've got on this list. And the reason I saved this one for last is because it is the cartridge I harvested my very first deer with. This is the 762 by 54 r also known as the Mosin the Gaunt Round. Uh, 762 by 54 r has been around a long time, well over 100 years at this point. And the 762 by 54 r ammo is cheap, and it is still everywhere. You really can't get some amazing stuff out of a 762x54R. You want to, don't go hunting with surplus ammo, please. It's full metal jacket. However, I would say this and maybe the 303 are the rounds that we've talked about that can push the farthest, which definitely has some intrinsic value, right? The other thing, most of the gaunts, really, really common. They're not as common uh, on the marketplace as they once were. I remember purchasing my first Mosinagant for $125, and I was kind of mad about it. I think it was $125. It was in the, it was in the mid to uh, 100 somewhere, and I was pissed off because I thought I had been ripped off. Uh, it came right out of the Cosmoline, though. It's still, uh, I still own it. I bubba the the rear sights and, and stuck a... Uh, a rail for an optic on it god forgive me but lots and lots of people own that rifle right lots of them and uh, because of that they have made their way onto hunting properties on more than one occasion people have done it and people will continue to do it probably as long as they can get their hands on the ammo we don't talk about political things very much on this podcast or at snore desert institute but the fact of the matter is this cartridge in this rifle is not getting regulated out of anything. Uh, 762 by 39 223 might be associated with firearms platforms that are a little more politically contentious. That's just not going to happen here. Same for 303 British. Um, something to keep in mind. Uh, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that this round rocks. You can do some really cool stuff with the 762 by 54 r I know some guys that uh, have hit at ranges I could only dream of with this round. Keep in mind your personal limitations when hunting with any round. But this is one that you can take and tag out to where you feel you are proficient. I would be very comfortable taking a 762 by 54 r out as far as the ranges that the southeast can provide and uh, if i had the right optic on it we had time to practice all that good stuff uh, i think if i had to take any of the rifles i own right now for a long range trip right this very second my most gaunt would be getting a uh, would be getting a re-baptism as my hunting rifle of choice uh, so there you have it guys you've got the 357 magnum You've got the 4570, you've got the 303, you've got the 762 by 39, you've got the 762 by 54 r and you've got the 223. There are some legitimate options in here for those of you who are thinking about whitetail hunting for the first time. And wonderful news, I've had some conversations with people this season about really wanting to get into hunting for the first time. They're out there. If you have a friend who's interested in hunting, Try to be a resource to them. This is a community that is passionate about the world we live in and uh, spending time out in creation and also being able to get good meat at a low price as uh, meat prices suck right now, as I'm sure you guys know. Lots of advantages to hunting and uh, it will be, I am certain, under scrutiny and potentially threat in future generations because of the dwindling hunter population numbers unless we do something about it it is a positive to society and the community is wonderful so get out there make some friends and if any of your friends are interested see if you can't help them get started all righty now back to our regularly scheduled programming this comes from sksboard.com sir jw perry 
Uh, and it's two stories, one that was good for him and one that was bad for him. Funny story that is bad for me. I had been trying to get my best friend to go shooting for about three months. He's not a gun person, but finally went. After about 500 total rounds between my USP-9 and USP-40, we hit paper less than 10 times. Worst day at the range in the history of man. Funny story. Yeah, not great. But funny story that is good for me. Two days after the above story, I went plinking with him and a couple of our other buddies. Just messing around, I shot three beer bottles set up on a sawhorse without even turning my head. The only comment my friends had to say was that I had to reset up some more bottles. I was missed that nobody had seen my perfect three for three hit without even looking. Well, JW Perry, at least you got to share your story on the SKS board. And as a result, it's being shared to other people. So hopefully you have some vindication through that. Before we bounce, um, let's talk about SDI one more time. SDI one more time. How are those grad features looking these days? Have we had one out recently? Uh, Archer? uh, Probably by the time this episode goes out, we should be having one on Zach Brokow. Excellent. Guys, if you don't, if you want to know about Sonoran Desert Institute, but you want to hear it from people that have been there and done that and don't just work there. Grad features are the way to go. If you hop on the SDI.edu news tab and then you click on grad features, which will be on a menu on the right under the news. When you click on that news tab, you will see stories from our graduates about their experience at this school. Uh, They're going to be able to clue you in a lot, um, maybe even on things that we can't as, as people that Uh, both currently work and formerly work in the marketing department. I think it's just a really good way for you guys to be able to connect and see if being a part of the SDI family is right for you. So sdi.edu, news tab, once you click there, on the right, grad features, that's the way to go. Check it out. We cannot recommend that to you strongly enough. And I can say this now um, because there's no, you know, as an SDI marketing dude, you have to, you know, kind of toe the line branding wise, and you still can't, I'm still not going rogue anywhere, but I will tell you of everything I did. And I shot some really freaking cool guns and I talked to some really cool people. I hung out with Mr. Guns and Deer for like a couple of days. um, And, you know, there's some really cool stories in there. The best part of my entire experience was speaking with those graduates. Mm. That's not me trying to be cheesy or anything. Our graduates are cool people. And it was an absolute pleasure to get to know some of them. I had a conversation with a guy named David Baz, who's now an adjunct faculty for us. And our conversation kind of got that started. I believe (laughs) that's last time I spoke to him. That was my understanding. We'll take credit Uh, for it. Yeah, I'll take credit. We had Jake Burden, who's been on this podcast a few times. He was a graduate. He was an adjunct faculty member when we met him. Now he's full time with us. Um, We have a tendency, Caleb Downing, another one who does a lot of videos for us. Um, we have a tendency to keep our people around because they are great people. Um, our graduates are worth listening to. And if you are students, still worth your time, maybe to check it out. And when you graduate, uh, sit down and have a conversation with us. Um, some of our compliance regulations, uh, do not permit us to interview active students. And even in full goblin mode, I, I still can't do that. Uh, but because I'll lose my job. Yeah, <laughs> you'd probably get your your wrist slapped. Um, and I don't think they'd blame us for wanting to talk to some of our awesome students. But uh, when you graduate, hit us up. We love those conversations. We love to have them with you. If you're a grad we haven't spoken to, you're listening to this right now, marketing at sdi.edu. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Folks, for now, that is the gun rack. I am fervently hoping that I do not get swarmed again by first responders as grateful as I am to those first responders Yes. Um, between now and the next time we record. um, Have fun out there. I've got some fun news for you guys. Uh, I can, I can end this with, so I have my concealed carry permit from a different state. And the reason I got that concealed carry permit from a different state is that at the time it was my understanding that it would process a lot faster than getting my done locally. And I still believe that would be the case. But what I forgot when I applied for that was that uh, my out-of-state permit, which is applicable in the state where I reside, uh, my non-resident, excuse me, non-resident permit 
uh, would not apply towards the purchase of firearms. So I have to go back and get pistol purchase permits like a common peasant. But I got an email yesterday saying that my permits were processed and they were done so quickly. Um, they put out a warning on their site. It's supposed to be like 10 days, something like that. And they put out a warning saying, hey, we're swamped. It's going to take six weeks. And I got it back. It might have been two and a half weeks. I think it was significantly less than that. So nice. super grateful to them for getting that done so quickly. And we're going to have some new inventory to talk about on this show. Let's go. Very soon. We're. I'll give you, um, currently I'm narrowing it down with some personal research. I'm looking at a new nine millimeter carry. I'm looking at the P365XL which is a striker fired handgun, which would literally be the first time in seven years that I, or six years that I've had a striker fired handgun, a IWI Masada Slim, which is brand Ooh. freaking new, brand new. Like I learned about their existence yesterday and I love IWI, very similar in size to the 365 XL and uh, the Smith & Wesson CSX. Those are the three that I'm looking at right now. As options, I actually was going to do the CZP07, decided against that. I want to do something small mm. uh, for some. The uh, six hour C3 I currently carry is wonderful, but I want to get even, I want to get full goblin mode. And goblin mode needs, means it, it needs to be goblin size for my, my little wretched goblin hands. <laughs> but also it needs to be big because my goblin hands are huge. But that's coming is the point. Yes. <laughs> uh, coming down the pipeline. And I'm very excited to share it with you. Uh, the first thing I thought when those permits came in, it was like, oh, yes, we get to podcast about it and share some reviews with you guys. I'm kind of hoping I can get it done fast enough that I can take it to this training I'm doing at the end of the month. We will see about that. But final notes, that's all. Have fun out there, guys. We will see you at the range. Stay safe. The Noran Desert Institute is an online school accredited by the DEAC. It is headquartered at 1555 West University Drive in Tempe, Arizona. For more information about how you can craft your firearms future, visit sdi.edu.